Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is on the meaning of fairness. I mean, what does fair really mean anyway? Life inherently it doesn't seem to be all that fair. In fact, Bob Dylan said, uh, man is opposed to fair play. He wants it all and he wants it his way. Life sometimes seems to be fair, oft times seems to be unfair, but from the earliest part of our lives, we have this sense of what's fair and what's not fair. I remember as a little kid always saying, but that's not fair. Yeah, you can argue that a kid wants what he wants, and demand, especially boy children, and they're going to get what they want. Girl children, too, I guess. Boys ask for it or demand it in a different way. But I, I think beyond that, Steve, there is some deep longing for justice, even as little kids. I don't know if it's a nature-nurture thing, where we pick it up, whether we're born with it. Maybe it's in our genetics. But I'm hearing a kid's voice. Maybe it's my own crying out. It's not fair. It's just one of the great disappointments of life. And I think it may come in a series of disappointments in childhood that life is not fair. And That's heartbreaking. And then we find out again how cruel and unjust it can be. And and that breaks our heart and demoralizes us a little bit more. I think we have to consider that each of us is challenged in our lives to deal with the apparent unfairness. Yeah, and it's like blatant, actually. I mean, when when a little kid grows up in abject poverty and has uh, you know nothing to eat and knows that there are these other kids who are like living in the lap of luxury, it just it can't be fair. It doesn't seem fair. It isn't fair. Anyhow, any way you look at it, it's not fair. It's not fair that I was born in the 20th century in one of the safest places in the history of the world with more opportunity and four loving parents, and a lot of kids were born with absolutely nothing. It's absolutely not fair, and life isn't fair, but. One of the things about the fact that life isn't fair is that you can determine the odds. I mean, you can make it not fair in your favor or not fair against you. You you have some control over this not fair thing called life. This is an interesting topic we've chosen because in addition to being a topic on its own, I think it's an entry point into something really big. The more I think about this now, the more I'm realizing how fundamental, at least it seems to me, to be. Again, the idea that it's not fair could arguably put us on a mission to make it fair, right? It could be some sort of deep calling within us, not sure how to frame it or how to describe it, but again, a longing or an urge to make things better. And maybe that's part of our nature, is to be a that's-not-fair detector, and then do your best to make it fair. Now, as a kid, of course, or a young adult even, some people maybe all of their lives, that fairness is essentially self-centered. But for many people who mature quickly and whose awareness expands to, wait a minute, my stake in this is pretty all-encompassing. There's really a community here, a world family of people, and If there's one person hungry and a bunch of other people have food, that's not fair. I have a stake in that somehow, even if that person's on the other side of the world. And it's in my interest to make that fair. I'm interested that in the current healthcare debate, for example, I rarely hear people talking about the common interest in public health as we at once understood the common interest in public education. People say, why should I have to pay for another child, not my family, to go to school? And the answer is because you benefit as being a member of the society. Same thing with health care. Why would you want poor people denied health care when your kid could pick up tuberculosis or some other contagious disease from that person that doesn't have health care. It's in your interest for everybody to be educated and for everybody to have health care. And Steve, what I'm saying is I think it's in our interest for things to be increasingly fair. And hopefully more and more people are aware of that and looking for ways to make beyond self-interest, to make the world a place that's more fair for everybody. Certainly the higher self we find in paradise. 
Well, you know, throughout history, the leaders of whatever group you were in, be it the small tribe of 50,000 years ago or nations of today, understood that there had to be some kind of fairness or the people will revolt. I mean, that's what revolution came from, was opposing what seemed to be unfair. So if if it gets too bad, like it did in uh, Napoleon's day, or you know, if it gets too bad, then people take over and they and they revolt. And so there's a a sense of fairness is a necessary ingredient of people not overthrowing the leader of the country. But I don't think it's inherent in the leader's mind that they want to be fair. Most leaders don't. I think they feel like they need to be somewhat fair, but they'd much rather just control it the way they want to control it. Most leaders, and what is the great quote, um, isn't it wonderful for leaders that people don't think? Adolf Hitler. You know? <laughs> so, so most leaders take advantage of the fact that people will just follow direction and do what they're told and, and not work with fairness as a, you know, a goal. It's just, I better be somewhat fair or else they'll revolt. Well, where is it in our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, uh, uh, our Pledge of Allegiance? I'm not sure. We have that phrase, truth, justice, and the American American way. Well, that's actually Superman. It's for liberty. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's liberty and justice for all, I think, at the end of the declaration, at the end of the Pledge of Allegiance. Justice is in there. Though. Liberty and justice for all. Yeah. And we have a criminal justice system, and then we have a civil law system. So government plays a very important role in trying to create a sense of justice. What about private corporations, though? Well, you know, depends on the corporation. I really do think that there are more who are getting involved in a sacred commerce and in, in caring about human beings and making the bottom line not just money, but also the impact upon the people that work for you and the customers that you touch and the impact upon the environment and the planet itself. I think we're seeing triple bottom line in some of the more enlightened CEOs in the world. I fortunately get to work with a whole bunch of those. But bottom line is, it's not supposed to be fair. In business, it's not supposed to be fair. If it was fair, then you wouldn't be able to take a, an advantage over your There'd customer. be no profit. Yeah, they, right. You know, it's not fair. It's not so, it's, You're supposed to, like, get the edge. You're supposed to find a way to do it better. Your margin. And, and, and the truth is, life is inherently not fair. I mean, that's the basic premise of, of how we work is not fair. To me, the, the concept that, for example... When we think negative thoughts and have negative feelings, our brain holds on to those like Velcro. It's just tight, you know, because this could be survival stuff. But when we have positive thoughts and positive feelings, given that there's no real survival advantage to them, our mind lets go of them like Teflon. Now, that's not fair. It takes five positive thoughts to equal the power of one negative thought. That's not fair. Of course, we can take the fact that it's unfair and turn it to our advantage by enhancing our positive thoughts more and more and more. Then our positive thoughts become more powerful than our negative thoughts, and we have the advantage of knowing how our mind works. The bottom line is, even though it's not fair, by knowing how it's not fair, you can turn it to your advantage. That's a pretty exciting idea, that we could initiate an accelerated rate of evolution or, or initiate evolution of consciousness in a particular direction because survival is not what it used to be so you're saying well the positive thoughts don't stick because there's no survival benefit the negative thoughts those are the warnings of danger so we can understand why they'd be more like what did you say more like velcro right so we could determine that it's an opportunity that each of us faces and maybe even a responsibility to train ourselves to make those positive thoughts more sticky, to see a benefit in being positive and sharing that positive, can I make the segue then, longing for justice and for fairness, part of our mission. If everybody did that, even if a few people did that, imagine if asked what's important in your life, imagine being able to say, I'm promoting my evolution. I'm, in fact, accelerating and promoting my evolution, expanding my interest in self to include the whole world. If you look at the basic premise of why the negative thoughts are sticky and the positive thoughts are slippery, it's because in the mind... For most of human history, our negative thoughts led us to survival, it, away from danger, uh, fight or flight kind of stuff. And, and uh, worrying and being concerned about things and bad things that could happen prepared us for that. So in the past, our negative thoughts were our survival. But now our negative thoughts are the greatest threat to our survival. 
It's our negative thoughts that cause us to worry, that cause hypertension, that cause the stress that leads to dis-ease, that leads to most uh, uh, mental and physical and emotional breakdowns. Most disorders come from stress. They cause heart attacks and cancer and strokes and, and all, the, all the stuff that kills us is caused primarily by the way we react to our negative thoughts and feelings. So the bottom line is these same negative thoughts that our brain believes is in our survival interest to hold on to is now dangerous to us. Can we let go of these negative thoughts and feelings? Well, yes, there's a way of making them more slippery, and that is by when you think them, take a deep breath and connect the feeling of safety to them, and that makes them less sticky. They're not survival-oriented as well. Take a deep breath, release, and the thoughts become less sticky. But so more, you're training the brain then to know that it is safe. Right. Safer than our ancestors' brains used to be. Right. When our ancestors worried that something horrible was going to happen that was going to actually kill them, it might have been true. But now, you know, there's nothing really dangerous that we need fight or flight reactions to. Now what we need is access to our creativity and our intuition and our, and our intelligence, and we need to be out of stress for that. So the bottom line is we can make our negative thoughts less sticky by breathing deeply into them. And I think even more significant what we can do is we can make our positive thoughts more sticky by hanging on to them a little bit longer, by going a little bit deeper with them, by pushing them in, by holding on to them. For example, if I'm walking down a beautiful little path and I see a gorgeous flower, I say, wow, what a cool flower. Maybe a second later, that's gone. Well, instead, I can go, wow, what a cool flower, and I can say, whoa, wow, what a really cool flower, and I can double the intensity of that good moment. What we can do is take those good moments, those, the, you finish a great meal, and you go, oh, that was wonderful, and then you move on to your next thought. Well, instead, now you go, oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was really <laughs> wonderful. You savor it. <laughs> savor it. That, that experience of making it stickier by putting more time and more energy and more emotion to it. Just take a, an experience that in the past would have been one or two seconds and make it three or four or five seconds and you change your brain. Yeah, well, this is mindfulness. This is paying attention. This is really smart. Look at memories. What do we remember and why do we remember the things we remember? You and I have done programs on this in the past. We'll talk about it more in the future. It has to do with emotional amplitude. So what I hear you saying is we could choose which memories to emphasize while we're experiencing them. We could choose to savor them, to be mindfully aware, and to say, make this memory sticky. <laughs> even though it's not my survival that's at stake here, this is important for me. Whatever it happens to be, you know, a sense of freedom, a sense of being with family and connectedness, a sense of accomplishment because you really did fix the car finally, whatever. Let me luxuriate in this moment. Let me make it sticky. And all we have to do is take a breath, relax, and sit right in the middle of that, pay attention to it, and it'll be ours forevermore. So we can make positive experiences sticky, whether they come from memory or from being in the now or from fantasizing the future. We can create positive feelings. Essentially what we're looking for, the negative thoughts and feelings kick out the adrenaline, and the positive thoughts and feelings push out the, the dopamine. You know, the feel-bad stuff and the feel-good stuff, the feel the feel fear stuff, the feel love stuff. So what we want to do, given that adrenaline kicks in stronger, the negative feelings are more powerful, is we need to luxuriate in the positive feelings. So if you have a negative thought from the past, a bad memory, regret, remorse, embarrassment, shame memory, what you do is if that memory comes up, you breathe and release the power of that. And then you luxuriate on how proud of yourself you are that you learned from it or that you are never going to do that again or that that caused you to grow in a certain way. And, and, and you made it through that. If nothing else, you did that, you made it through that. So luxuriate in that feeling of pride and accomplishment and make sure that that feeling, get, the mind gets the idea, make this sticky. This is important to my survival. Remembering the good stuff is important to my survival because it counterbalances those negative thoughts and feelings that cause me stress. The warm fuzzies. That yeah. After. You know, there was a period in the 60s and the 70s, especially I think maybe even in the 80s, maybe even to this day, where people are mocked by others 
based on this axiom, well, if it feels good, do it, as if that's a bad thing. If it feels good, do it. I'd like to suggest everything we do is motivated by feel good. There do need to be restraints in place, obviously. We have a yin and a yang in our emotional nature. We have an ebb and a flow in our mental nature. We have a conscience. Again, if we breathe, if we're relaxed and feeling safe, it's easier to find that balance between freedom and restraint, between wanting to feel good and being aware of other people's rights and appearances and all of the other restraints, areas where there are restraint. But what's wrong with if it feels good, do it? Most religions, bottom line, say God is love. Love feels good. I suspect a lot of this just is divided on the emotional versus physical. The old good versus evil kind of thing is that, okay, the the fundamentalist will acknowledge that love is a feel good is okay, but to dance, to go to movies, to wear makeup, to uh, drink alcohol, or to use recreational drugs, or to uh, have sexual relations outside of marriage, that this is somehow a bad kind of feeling good because it's physical. That if it's non-physical feel good, that's love, that's okay, but if it's a physical feel good, that's bad. And so I'm still working with this in my own mind, this idea of what is it that motivates us and what's really wrong with being motivated by what feels good. And I got to say, justice and fairness feels good. It feels right. It feels whole. It feels complete. One of the things I love about nature is her integrity and her reliability and There's a certain unpredictability in nature. You never know when it's going to rain or the lightning is going to strike the tree and it'll fall down in front of you or whatever. Should I be so lucky as to see something like that? But she's reliable and predictable to a large degree, more so than humans. We're in much greater danger in cities where you don't have that integrity and that reliability and I guess I'm still arguing for this idea that there's something inherently good about our longing for fairness and for justice in the world. I think that's absolutely right. I think we have these, you know, two polar opposite drives inside us from the earliest of any creature. You move toward pleasure and away from pain. It's pretty basic. You know, a one-celled creature will move move away from what hurts and toward what feels good to eat or to mate, you know, basically, or... 10 cells or 100 cells or whatever size creatures we're talking about. It's inherent to want to move toward what feels good and away from what feels bad. That's inherent. But that's not fair when you're in an environment with mostly stuff that feels bad and only a little stuff that feels good. It's equally not fair when you're in an environment with mostly stuff that feels good and some stuff that feels bad. The point is, as human beings, we get to create which environment we're in. Life's going to be not fair. Basically, it's not going to be exactly the same amount of good and bad. It's not going to be fair. But we can decide whether it's mostly good and a little bad or mostly bad and a little good by which we make sticky. And it's inherent in our autopilot to make the negative stuff sticky because that's survival stuff from thousands of years ago. But we can change our minds. We can make the positive stuff sticky by enhancing it, by spending more time with it by luxuriating in it by going deeper in it whether it's a negative memory that we remember the positive applications of what we learn from it whether or it's a positive memory we luxuriate in whether it's an experience in the now of seeing something or smelling something or tasting something or hearing something that's just beautiful take an extra minute instead of just a minute take an extra minute and luxuriate in the good feelings. This is a salve for all your negative wounds that you have inside of you. The more time you spend in this positive stuff, the more your brain changes to a more positive brain. The more you make the positive stuff more important than the negative stuff, the more your brain changes. It morphs into a more positive kind of thinking brain. And the less it pays attention to the negative stuff, and more it pays attention to the positive stuff. You can change your brain. It's neuroplasticity. You can do it by two things, by taking the power away from your negative thoughts, by breathing and releasing the physical hold they have over you, and then by 
putting more emphasis, more power, luxuriate more deeply in the positive thoughts and feelings you have, you remember, and you fantasize about. I think this is really cool. Let's talk a little bit about revenge or the seeming need for vengeance, the idea that we have to set things right and further set people straight. Not only do we have to make them right, we have to educate somebody, make sure they understand the lesson. Like, that's my job now, right? I've been victimized somehow, so I'm going to seek some sort of, I'm going to get my pound of flesh. Eye for an eye. An eye for an eye. I want my vengeance. I want what's fair. Like your uncle said, fair is fair, right? Funny, an eye for an eye, that Old Testament injunction was actually intended not to justify punishment, but to limit punishment to no more than an eye for an eye. And it also had nothing to do with the physical eye. It had to do with money uh, or the amounts of something. It's like no interest is allowed. You know, you're only allowed to charge an eye for an eye. So people often use that in a in a funny kind of way as if to justify, well, I need revenge. Right. After all, it's only fair that I get my revenge. And actually, this... This axiom, an eye for an eye, is to limit that whole idea. And then Christ comes along and says, no, 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 no. You you don't do that. It's like, let it go. Turn the other cheek. Be forgiving, right? My wife has a nice phrase. Leave them to their own lessons, right? It's like a reminder that they've got a conscience. You may not want to admit it. You might think this is your job to set them straight, to teach them a lesson. Listen to these phrases. Where do we get this idea that that's our job? I think it's a dodge. I think it's a way of avoiding responsibility for our own life. Yeah, and the need for revenge, like that they they took mine, so I'm going to take theirs kind of thing, is kind of like cutting your own arm and watching yourself bleed and hoping they bleed to death. You know, you're hurting yourself. You're not hurting them. They're, this this anger this thing that's eating you up inside they don't even know what's going on you know and and if they do they don't pay a whole lot of attention to it it's your stuff it's not theirs the the world isn't fair and bad stuff happens to good people and good stuff happens to bad people and that's just not fair what we can do is we can have a sense of what's fair for our society not for perhaps any individuals but you know what's fair civil rights and and uh, everybody gets to vote you know the fairness for our society we can play with but in terms of our own lives we don't want it to be fair we want it to be very very biased toward us we want life to be much more good than it is bad not equal good and bad you know we're going to experience we need to experience good and bad in our lives to appreciate the other one but and we need to go real deep into what feels bad to be able to allow ourselves to go real deep into what feels good but that doesn't mean we have to spend half our time there you know we can spend a very small percentage of our time in a world that feels bad and much more of our time in a world that feels good by retraining our brain to make the positive stuff sticky and the negative stuff slippery there's much in philosophy and psychology about the middle way about balance or moderation mediation arbitration conciliation the idea that the answers to our problems are not in the extremes of things, but somewhere in the middle. doesn't have to be the 50-50, but fairness is in the middle. And so when we find ourselves locked in a binary black or white argument with somebody, and we find that each of us is hoping the other person will somehow lose so that I can win, and that's all we've got, remind yourself, the truth is in the middle. Fairness is in the middle. Justice is in the middle. It might be a 90-10 middle. It might be a 20-80 middle or a 55-45 middle, some blend, somewhere in between. But it's not going to be an exclusive all of this or none of that. I think that's inherent to fairness and justice, the idea of a balance or a center. Yeah, and in politics, for example, you can have a tyranny of the minority, you know, I mean, you can have a a small group of people who have more power than they deserve to have control things. So it's fair doesn't mean equal. Fair doesn't mean the same amount on one side of the ledger as on the other side of the ledger. Fair, I think, is just an acknowledgement of the way the universe operates. And it's, it's fair here, it's unfair there. 
it's not inherently going to equal out in your lifetime. You know, it's not you're not going to end up your life with the exact amount of good and the exact amount of bad. It's not going to be fair. Life is going to provide some people with many, many more positive opportunities and far fewer kick in the butts and other people are just going to have to make it through more and more difficult challenges than than they should have to make it through. But on an individual level, we do have some control over what life appears to be and fair unfair we can choose it to be unfair to our advantage we can see the advantages we have we can we can really pay attention to those positive things that happen in our lives and we can really downplay the negative things that happen in our lives as as they are lessons we can learn from and we can we can make good out of everything when life gives you lemons squeeze it over lobster you know uh, a positive thinker doesn't only have positive thoughts he does something or she does something positive with all of their thoughts we can make the game rigged to our advantage, but the game is rigged because if you just let your mind do what it's going to do, it's going to pay much more attention to the negative stuff than the positive stuff. Five times more powerful because the mind still thinks those negative thoughts might be actually dangerous. We've talked a little bit about how government can approach fairness or justice, it's usually called in legal terms. Let's touch on religion because here we have, in many cases, a promise of eternal happiness, or at least eternal life, life everlasting in a very happy place, this heaven, this nirvana, as if to say, well, life may be unfair on earth, but if you suffer well, if you behave and live according to these rules, these principles, these guidelines, then you get the gold ring, you get to go to heaven, you get to, this is, it's, it's a deferred kind of a, a sense of fairness or justice. Like, your life may not look fair as you're on your deathbed, but believe me, in the long term, I think we see that in Eastern philosophy, too, with the idea of karma. It's a little different. The idea there is that it's not delayed until you die because they believe in reincarnation. So that makes it a continual process of expansion and contraction, the ebb and flow of needing to learn a lesson, making mistakes. Uh, In the West, it might be called sinning, but in the East, they don't use that term or one like it. They just see it as lessons learned. And then you learn the lesson in this lifetime and another lifetime. But again, there is a spiritual, if you will, sense of fairness. Sure. And as they say, you know, if you do follow directions, obey instructions, and live life within the non-sin guidelines, you get to go to heaven. It wouldn't be fair if people who didn't do that got to go to heaven. So there's got to be this other thing, of course, called hell, eternal punishment. The worst possible thing you could possibly conceive of, well... That doesn't touch it. It's way, way worse than that. That's that's the whole concept is like if if you do follow directions, life is fair because if you do follow directions, then you get this perfect, wonderful outcome. And if you don't follow directions, you get this worst possible outcome. You know, pardon my uh, cynicalness, but that just doesn't seem realistic to me. Well, depends on who's given the directions. Right? Exactly. But, you know, there is a certain amount of fairness that does happen. I mean, it seems to me that... Uh, those people who live good, healthy, uh, caring, giving lives, generally speaking, have better ends than those that live those lives where they hurt and and intentionally, you know, do bad things to people. There are exceptions. I mean, I was not very far away when an idiot put a bullet through Bobby Kennedy's, you know. I mean, you know, there are some people who do good stuff and end up in real bad ways and vice versa. There are some criminals uh, in the mafia probably who are, you know, 100 years old and are just living and smoking their stogies and thinking back on how they screwed over everybody. So, yeah, it doesn't always work out. But generally speaking, the more good you do, the more likely you are, are to have, I think, a good end in this life. The mistake is judging others instead of testing through yourself. You are the instrument. Each of us is an instrument. So tune the instrument Tune it finely. Make sure it's well calibrated because your experience is the only one that you can know. To, as Steve is describing, judge other people and admit it. We all do it. We've done it before. We have these stories, these voices in our heads, these stories that we tell ourselves about other people. But at the end of the day, you just don't know that this happy person may in fact be suffering This person over here who appears to be miserable 
may know a simple joy that has escaped you till now. So give up the judging. There is, again, throughout religion and philosophy, many, many admonitions about this. And it's confusing because you do need to judge in life from time to time. But we don't need to judge other people. Maybe it's circumstances that sometimes we have to do some judging and make some critical decisions. But I think most of those admonitions about judge not lest ye be judged and such is about trying to understand yourself by comparing yourself to others. And you can't do that. It's it's backwards. You never heard any great wisdom, no other people inscribed over the oracle, you know, figure out the enemy. It's always know thyself. That's the That's where the liberation is. And in knowing thyself, what you can do is you can change the actual physical structure of your brain to make it much more longing for those positive thoughts, feelings, memories, fantasies, and much more able to just not pay as much attention to the negative ones. It's it's not ignoring them. It's taking the emotional charge off of them. It's making them, when they do pop up, not affect you emotionally very much anymore. They're memories. They're just stuff that happened. So the brain thinks it good, it's good to hold on real strong to those kinds of things because your survival may be at stake, but just the opposite is true now. The more we hang on to those negative thoughts and feelings, the more we threaten our survival with states of stress and hypertension. So it's all about going out of stress into a stress-released place. It's all about getting out of the uh, imaginary hell that people create for their lives and create internally a, a state Michael and I like to call paradise. Yeah, let's go there now and walk through a process like that. How do you take the negative stuff that's tends to be sticky because it's survival-oriented. We inherited this from our ancestors. And let go of that, make it a little more slippery. And then take what has been slippery, the positive stuff, because it didn't really aid your survival. And understand that now it does aid your survival. And so the positive stuff we want to make sticky. Not hold on to. Remember, anything you hold on to, that's muscular tension. That's fear. That's a reaction. You make yourself a victim when you hold on to it. We're talking about allowing yourself to be surrounded by it, to stand in a kind of a, a magnetic field and, and know that consciousness is cohesive. That's what we mean by sticky. So let's expand that consciousness and its magnetic influence and uh, see if it doesn't get even more cohesive, everywhere equally present. And when you come out of stress, and a process of thinking of a whole bunch of different things back and forth, back and forth, and close your eyes and take a deep breath and go to this peaceful place inside, of course, your whole mind becomes more sticky. Because when a bunch of stuff is going by, nothing really sticks. But when your mind moves into this state of focused passion, well, then everything does. So it starts with closing your eyes, cutting out 86% of that sensory input, cutting it down to only 14%. And then with that deep breath, allow your mind to understand you're safe. And as you release, now's the time to conjure up that beautiful place of peace. That calm, serene, real tranquil scene where you always feel so safe and free. This place of paradise. This alpha state. This is where you get to be. Remember a time that you felt really, really safe and relaxed and enjoyed a peace of mind. You still had a thought stream in your head, but you noticed that it wasn't as frenetic or chaotic as usual. And you enjoyed the feeling of that thought stream gently flowing through your mind and similarly a, a stream of feelings that instead of raging like whitewater rapids is now just meandering through your heart. And you feel a quality of contentment as we encourage you to luxuriate in that feeling. 
linger here a while and allow yourself to experience full immersion in the satisfaction and the contentment of your life working for you right now in this moment without regard to the future without reflecting upon the past give yourself permission to admit that right here right now you're feeling really really good And it feels good to feel good. In fact, it feels great. And this is a feeling that you can create. So take a few moments and luxuriate in this feeling of feeling good. Maybe it feels even better and better and better too. Inside your body, There's a feeling that you really like. Somewhere it's a glow. It's a wonderful feeling of energy flow. And it makes you smile. (sighs) And it feels like peace. It allows whatever in the way to easily release. And these good feelings... They stick around. They sort of want to cling. These positive feelings, the ones that make you want to laugh and sing, these feelings, they get sticky. And they really want to stay. And anything negative, thoughts and feelings, well, they just float away. Any negative thoughts or feelings just simply float away. And you feel good. And you enjoy this feeling good. And you employ your consciousness, your purposefulness to decide that you want to stay. Spend more time here in feeling good every single day. Work for justice, every day in every way. Beware of the trap that we sometimes set up for ourselves that looks something like, well, I can't fix it all, I can't do everything, and so why even bother? When you work for justice, every little bit helps. Every contribution you could possibly make... Follow those internal promptings. There can be no peace, no lasting peace, no true peace without justice. It unsettles the human spirit. It's too disturbing at our roots for us to tolerate injustice. And there is gross injustice in this world. And the best thing we can do to correct that injustice is to become aware of it. To simply acknowledge it and then talk to your friends about it. What can I do socially, politically, economically in terms of my education or the education of other people? Look at all the opportunities to give meaning to your life by working for peace Injustice. So focus on a place where injustice exists somewhere in your world. And know that you could take a step toward making things more fair. One step with this plan unfurled of thinking the injustice is settled and that things are Now back to fair. Imagine, project into the future a time when you're already there. By imagining the injustice as something that's healed, something that's set right, just pretending that it's already true in your world, 
that shines the light. First step you can possibly take is to start with the end in mind. So imagine injustice as already healed, and as you do, you find some new ways to participate, some new things to do, some new ways to involve the passion in you in creating a fairness that you strongly desire. Imagine the world healed, and it stokes the fire. There's an axiom in sports that it's not whether you win or lose the game, but how you play the game that really counts. That's what really matters. When it comes to examining fairness and justice, I'd suggest the same thing is true. It's not whether you win or lose. It's not even how much you accomplish. It's that you make a contribution because it adds depth and breadth to the meaning of your life. As you contribute to fairness and justice in other people's lives, guess what comes back to you? More peace, more fairness, more justice, which you then cycle around and continue the process around and around and around it goes. Some call it kindness. Some call it conscience. Some say it's just simply being awake and aware. Identify and acknowledge your urge for fairness, that right's right and wrong's wrong, and yeah, there's a huge middle, and that's where we get together and work things out, because fair is fair. So in those areas where life's not fair, What we have to do is adjust. We have to recognize that it's our perception and response that we can control. And in fact, we must. Because when bad things happen, we can turn it around and learn lessons and really grow. And when good things happen, we can make it stick around and let our brain really know that this matters. This matters a lot. This good thing that I'm going through I'm going to hold on and release and hold on and release all the negative stuff as it goes through. But this positive thing, it's magnetic. It just sort of hangs around. And as I put my consciousness on it, I let myself surround myself with these feelings of feeling good. And I retrain my brain. And I explain, this is what you could experience instead inside your heart and your head, this feeling of consistent joy. Take the negative thoughts and let them release. Let the positive thoughts surround you in peace. And you cease to feel like life is unfair because you're where you want to be and you like being there. Bring these feelings with you effortlessly. They are magnetic. They are cohesive. This is love, truth, conscious awareness. Bring it with you into the waking state as you reorient yourself, first to the sound of her voices, remembering the room around you, Take a nice, slow, deep breath, filling your lungs with strength and power. Hold as you peak. And now as you exhale, ah, feel the letting go and open your eyes, wide awake and alert, refreshed and re-energized and back in the room. You know, one of the most wonderful, unfair things about life is that by giving just a little, you get a real lot. You know, that's you don't have to do much to get so many positive feelings that you get to relive over and over and over and over again. Give once, and you could have a thousand positive memories of doing so. So life isn't fair, but you can use it in, in your advantage. And, you know, it's also not fair that some things that are worth a whole lot of money cost a whole lot of money, but some things that are worth a whole lot of money don't cost hardly anything at all. And that's not fair, but it's the way life really is, so... These programs, which are worth a whole lot, are only 99 cents a piece. I don't think that's fair, but hey, we'll live with it. (laughs) 
And because they're not copyrighted by intent, we'd like you to forward them to your friends. Who did you think of when you listened to this program? Or as you look back now, who do you know that would not only enjoy but really benefit from listening to a program like this? Well, log into your account at focusedpassion.com and we'll make it easy to send a link to them. Once you're logged in, right below the built-in player, you'll see the send one to a friend gadget. And all you got to do is add their first name and email address and choose the program you want to forward. And in a matter of seconds, it's gone. It's on its way and it doesn't cost a red cent. So that's the other side of this is to pay it forward, to pass it on, to move it on out into the world. Consciousness, love, truth, Fairness, this longing for justice is not only cohesive, it's radiatory. It's why it feels warm. It's an energy. It's a very real thing. So let it go. Let it radiate out there into the world. And uh, give these uh, programs away for the benefit of the people who receive them and also so that you have an experience where you can feel good having done this wonderful thing that you can relive over and over and over again. Send one to a friend, and if they send them to their friends, we can get this stuff out to the whole wide world. Yep, that's what folks need. Thanks very much for being with us. We'll talk to you next week as we continue to bring you episodes 52 a year in our Finding Yourself in Paradise series. As always, be gentle, love life, and do take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui.